be with you. If you have a Bible, and I hope that you do, would you turn with me to what was just read this morning? We are going to be in Hebrews chapter 13, looking at the first six verses of the chapter, which means that as we've been working through the series, we are finally coming to the end of the book. We are in the final chapter this morning, and through this book, what we've seen is that the author has two primary purposes in mind. The first is he wants to exalt Christ. He wants you to see Jesus for who he truly is, as being greater. That's the theme of the entire book, is that Jesus is greater. He's bigger, he's better, he's more beautiful than anything in this world. And so through the book, he's been comparing Jesus to so many different things that these Jewish Christians would have held dear. He compares Jesus to the angels. He compares Jesus to Abraham to Moses, to the Old Covenant, to the sacrificial system, to so many different things. And he shows in every single instance how Christ is greater. But then he also is wanting to encourage these Jewish Christians to persevere in the faith because many of them are experiencing harsh persecution. Many of them, because of their faith in Jesus as their Messiah, as their king, many of them now are being kicked out of their synagogues. They aren't allowed to gather in their meeting place to worship Yahweh. Many are being kicked out of their homes. Many of their parents have disowned them. Some of their spouses have divorced them and abandoned them because of their faith in Jesus. So he wants to be very clear in encouraging them to run the race of faith well, to persevere, to not give up, to keep their eyes fixed on Jesus, reminding them that he truly is greater, not to give up hope. And so we finished chapter 12 last week with this beautiful depiction of what Christ has done for us, why we should keep looking to him, not giving up on our faith, even whenever we are experiencing some very severe, difficult uh, situations or storms in our lives. And what he did is he pictured for us two mountains. We had Mount Sinai and we had Mount Zion. And what he explains to us is that we are no longer on or by Mount Sinai which is where the law was, where fire and thunder and lightning and death was. Rather, he says we have moved from Mount Sinai, and now Christ is leading us to Zion. And in Zion, we have an unshakable kingdom, a kingdom that is now and not yet. Hey, Sarah, could you just leave me right where I'm at and just, if we can keep it right there, we don't have to worry about anything else on the live stream. Um, But through Zion, we have come to a kingdom that is now and not yet. We are actually able to approach God, the unapproachable God right now, through what Christ did. And so as we think about this, if you really can understand who Jesus is, that he is the greatest thing that possibly could ever exist, and that he has made a way for us to approach him through his death on the cross, and now through his intercession in heaven— What that then should do in in us, it should lead to a response. And that is that we should want to worship him with godly fear and humility. And that's how we ended chapter 12. If you just read that, in verse 28, it says, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. So what this is saying is, if you realize what this whole book has been telling you about who Jesus is, it should ignite something in you. It's calling for a response, for you to worship God for all that he has done in the person of Jesus Christ. And so then as we come to chapter 13 this morning, that's what we're going to be seeing. You're going to see the call to respond. And really what this is, is not going to be anything that's so um, deep that you, you probably have never heard this before. In fact, this is going to be very fundamental. This is actually what practical Christianity should look like. If you really understand who Jesus is, and you understand what he's done for your life, and if you say, I want to persevere in the faith, and I want to live a life that honors Christ, you're going to see these things in this text of what it means to be a true practical Christian. 
And so as we look then this morning in verses 1 to 3, the first thing that we're going to draw from the text is we're going to see the call to love people. If you truly know who Jesus is, and if you truly want to worship him, you have to love people. What this reminds us is that our vertical relationship will affect our horizontal relationships. You cannot love and worship God unless you truly love people. And in verses 1 to 3, you're going to see that there's three groups that we as the church are called to love. We're to love the saints, we're to love strangers, and we are to love prisoners. Those are the three that we see in this text. But the first one, as we see in verse 1, it says, Let brotherly love continue. What I think this shows us is that, first off, there's a type of love within the church known as brotherly love. You know, Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love, that is what we have for one another in the church, a relational love as brothers and sisters, because in Christ, we have become a family. When you understand what Christ has done, we have become the family of God. So if you see other believers, you see your brothers and your sisters. And what he wants them to hear here in this text is, now that you understand what God has done, who Jesus is, love your brothers and sisters in Christ, recognizing that we now all are equal in Christ, that we all can approach the throne of grace, that he has redeemed and given all of us forgiveness. But he goes more than just saying, love your brothers, but he says, continue in brotherly love. Why is that? Well, probably because they've loved each other in the past. Many of them probably had affection for one another, but he also understood as they continue to experience persecution and hostility, and as things get harder and as your resources start to deplete, you can become really desperate, can't you? Whenever life gets hard, you can really start to get self-centered and focused on yourself. You can start to worry about things and start to lash out at people because now you're really stressed. Have you ever done that? I know that I've done that with my wife at times, right? You get really stressed, and even if they're trying to help, but, you know, you're you're trying to focus, and so you you say something maybe you don't mean, or, or you get overly agitated when you shouldn't have. He's saying, don't let this occur in your body. He says, make sure that you continue to love one another. And in fact, I think this reminds us then that love is not just simply an emotion, So often in our culture, we think love is an emotion. It's a feeling. And if that was the case, then we'd all stop loving each other a lot of the time because there's a lot of times where we have feelings, where we don't like each other, where we disagree with one another. We we have spats and and quarrels and, and all these different things that happen within being in a family unit. But what he says, I want you to choose to continue in love, to choose to love your brothers and sisters, even when they are imperfect because we know what Christ did. And in fact, this love is what we are to let the world know that we are his disciples. John 13, 35 says, by this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So in fact, if we want to be living out the faith, and if we want people to truly know Jesus as we know him and experience him, then you have to love other people. You have to love your brothers and sisters in Christ. Why would they come to a God if you don't even truly love people, if you aren't showing the love of God? That's not a God that they want to worship. So we have to love one another. And if we really do that, if we allow our congregation to embrace the love of Christ and we actually live it out, it's a relationship that the world can't really understand. Because a, a loving relationship within the church family, it's deeper than any other relationship. It's deeper than a friendship. It's deeper than a relationship between spouses. It's deeper than your ethnic background. The deepest, most intimate relationship we have is that union in Jesus Christ. And when the world starts to see Christians really living that out, not just saying we love one another and we say hi on a Sunday morning and then we do nothing with them, but if we really are doing life together, really loving one another, caring for one another, being there, even if our, our brothers and sisters don't have anything else to offer us at the moment, but we still continue to pursue them in love, the world's going to see that's so different. 
That's not like anything else I've ever seen or experienced. That is what he is calling us to here. And if you start to manifest this love for brothers and sisters in Christ, you're going to see that this love doesn't just stay in the building. It doesn't just stay in the body. Rather, it starts to just overflow. Our love for Christ and for one another, it doesn't stay with the family. Rather, because we have such love, it starts to actually just bubble out to our world. And that's where I think he starts to go in this text. In verse 2, we see that he continues by saying, And do not forget to entertain strangers. So we had the brotherly love, that, that affectionate love where we know people, we see them on a day-to-day basis, or we see them weekly for gatherings, we, we have their phone number. But then he says, but that's not where your love stops. Your love is going to the world. And without it will then imply that your love is going to go to the unknown, to the strangers. And he says, do not forget, or another translation might say, do not neglect to entertain strangers. So this is actually a calling for the church to hospitality. Do you think that the people close to you in your life would describe you as a hospitable person? And I'm not just saying for your brothers and sisters in Christ. A hospitable person for when you see that person that seems to be down and out. Maybe doesn't have a lot of friends, doesn't have a high social value in the community. Are you that person that always wants to make sure that they're still invited to dinner, to lunch? If they need a place to stay for a night, are you that person that says, we're going to give the spare bedroom, or we're going to give them the couch? We're going to see if there's a way that we can help meet the needs of strangers, because this was really an important ministry in the early church. Now, we do have a little bit of a different world here in our culture, because we have hotels, motels, pretty easily accessible here. You know, we don't have as many people traveling as they had to travel in this world, and we have to understand that many of these Christians were being persecuted, So there would have been potentially brothers and sisters in Christ that they had never met before. And they were having to flee persecution, and they may have needed to stay in your home. Would you be like that? Today in our world, we are so weird about opening up our homes, I think, sometimes. You know, it used to be where, you know, people would never lock their doors. Now, most people always have their doors locked. Or if someone rings your doorbell, I know that it's, for me, I'm always like, well, who's here? They're ringing my door, but they haven't called me or texted me saying they're coming. It's really weird if someone's showing up on the door and I didn't know they were coming. It's just kind of the world that we're in. But in their culture, hospitality was so important. If you had someone visiting, it was so important that you made sure that you would meet their needs. In fact, we see some stories and parables where there's a a person that comes unexpectedly to their house, and because they came at such a late hour, they weren't prepared and ready to host them, and so they start going banging on their neighbor's door and saying, please give me some supplies because I want to make sure that this person is taken care of. That's how important hospitality was. But do we have that mindset Are we saying, how can I open my home more rather than us go and hide in our own caves? That's what's starting to happen. We we build up bigger kingdoms in our neighborhoods, and then we want to stay in our kingdom, and we don't want to go out anymore. It's so much to ask people just to go to church on a Sunday and a Wednesday. That's way too much. You're asking too much of me, God, to be here Sunday and Wednesday because I need to go to work, and then I need to be in my castle, be in my cave. That's That's what we're doing. But he's calling us to something else. He says, no, you need to go. Be hospitable. And how do you get to entertain strangers, by the way? You have to encounter them. Strangers aren't normally going to just come to your address. You got to go find them in the town square, in the marketplace. You have to see the needs. You actually, actually have to have physical touch to be present with these people to even know about these needs. And really, I think hospitality, not only is it important for us to do for our brothers and sisters, for for strangers, but really it's the way that we truly get to know one another. See, I can say hi to you on Sunday morning, and, and you might open up a little bit after maybe a sermon or a service, and you might let me know what's going on, and maybe we'll get to pray together, or maybe you'll send me a text or something like that outside of the, 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 the service or our or, or normal things. But the thing is, there's something so much different and more intimate when you're sharing a meal with one another, especially when you are in the home of someone, because you get to see what they live like. You get to see what they see when they're trying to relax, 
when they're having to deal with the kids, you didn't realize what Liam's like going crazy all the time. You don't see that, wow, he really doesn't have an off button. And now you got two babies crying, and then you got the dog over here barking. You don't get to see all that all the time. And see all that stress, and oh, that's how Zach's trying to study the Bible with all this going on. And then I got to go help Casey with something else. So you get to really learn and appreciate and understand people when you entertain them in your homes. And so it's so important that if we want to love one another, and if we want to show the love of Christ to the world, we have to show hospitality. We have to open up our homes. And then what's so cool in verse 2, it just kind of subtly just drops this little moment in there, and you're just like, "What? I want you to unpack this some more. What do you mean? But it literally says in here, for by so doing, some have unwittingly entertained angels. You're like, What? Well, we just saw in chapter 12 how it says that through Christ and being a part of the kingdom of Zion, it says that you actually are now in fellowship with angels, and we just saw it quickly in passing. Well, now what it says here is that if you are someone who regularly is meeting the needs of others, and if you're showing hospitality and welcoming in strangers, some of you have probably encountered angels, angelic beings. Now, I know that the word angel can mean messenger here, and it's very possible that some have tried to articulate it and think that it's talking about, well, maybe that you are going to invite someone in and maybe God is going to speak a message through them that maybe if you weren't hospitable, you wouldn't have heard that. And maybe so God will use that person. I think that's possible. But I think what it's saying here is I think that really we know that there are times where angels will encounter humans. I think of Genesis 18 where Abraham, he was just there and then all of a sudden there was three visitors that approached him. And he immediately ran to the tent, went to show them hospitality, and we find that one of them was Yahweh, actually, in his presence, but then two others were angels. So he unwittingly encounters the Lord and angels. And so how cool is it to think that if you are someone that is just opening your home, showing love to those people that you don't know, maybe you go to the soup kitchen, maybe you go to the pantry, and maybe sometimes... You actually are not ministering to a a normal person. Rather, maybe it's God sending a a servant, a messenger, to come bless you, to come encounter you, to encourage you to continue in the faith. It's just so cool that we see this here, that when we love God, when we love people, and when we love strangers, that even God will send sometimes these angelic beings in our presence. A really, really cool thought. But then one other group that we see here in the text. In verse 3, it then says, not only are you to love with brotherly love and let it continue, are you to not forget to entertain strangers, but it also says to remember the prisoners as if chained with them, those who are mistreated since you yourselves are in the body also. So what this is then showing us is also the group that most people are going to just completely forget get rid of, because these are the ones who were in prison. They did something wrong. Now, it is possible that some of these may have actually been Christian prisoners, because we know many of them were being imprisoned and persecuted. So it could be that he's saying, don't forget your brothers and sisters who are in prison. But it also could apply, and I think it definitely should apply to us, about those who are down and out, about those who have been forgotten by society. And I'm so thankful that we as a church, though we are smaller, have the opportunity to do prison ministry through Roy King. And if you haven't been able to read some of the letters from the prisoners, I really want to encourage you to do that. We have them right there in the um, foyer between the Connect Center and here, where it literally has heartfelt letters of inmates who have been blessed by our support, our ministry through Roy they are actually seeing and hearing and recognizing that God hasn't forgotten them. That there is still grace available for them. The cross is sufficient for them. It's because we haven't forgotten them. And it's so important that we make sure that we never forget those who are suffering. I understand they have made a bad decision potentially. They may have broken the law, but we all know that we all have broken God's law. And there's so many things that you have probably done in your life that maybe if you were in the wrong place at the wrong time, that maybe you would be in the same place that they are at. So it's so important that we recognize there are people in prison and we are to love them, 
just like we love all of these other people. And in fact, it says that you are to think about what if you were the one in prison? How would you feel based on your church family if this is the way that you responded and cared for them? But even further than that, if you just hear the words of Christ, because ministering to prisoners will also reflect how you are ministering to Christ, your Lord himself. In Matthew 25, verses 36 to 40, it says, I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and gave, give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. He's saying to the least of these brethren. When you think of those people that most people don't value, he says how you treat the most vulnerable in your communities, that is how you treat your Lord. So are we going to be convicted by that or encouraged by that? We say, I want to honor the Lord. And so I'm going to seek out the broken and the lost. I'm going to care for the needy. Seek to utilize the resources and the means that I have to bring the kingdom here and now. So we get the call to love people. Love the saints, love strangers, love prisoners. But then we move to verse 4, and we see a call to honor marriage. Marriage is honorable among all and the bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers God will judge. Now that almost seems a little weird. It's like we're just talking about loving people and we're supposed to love these different groups. And then it says that marriage is to be honorable among all. And some translations might even kind of give you the same word where it says let brotherly love continue. Some will say let marriage be honored. And then we'll see later it says let your conduct be without covetousness. It seems that these are three exhortations, three callings for the church, but you still might be wondering, well, why is it that we're making such a a big mess about marriage in this call? You would have probably guessed, if you're like, what are some of the three exhortations that we're going to get for practical Christian living? Many probably wouldn't put honor marriage as one of those three. Maybe you would, but probably not. Well, I think the reason that we will see here is that we are being called to honor the sanctity of marriage, I think it's because healthy homes produce healthy churches. That is to say, if we want to see the first thing, to love people well, we want to see the saints being loved, we want to see strangers and prisoners being loved, we want to see the love of Christ being manifest on the earth, the gospel being advanced. If we want to see that happen, it starts in the home. And if marriage is not honored, if it's not protected and cherished, then it's going to affect your churches. If you're not worshiping the Lord in your home with your, the husband and the wife, then how do you think it's going to reflect when you come in a bigger body? Rather, you're going to have a lot of broken homes coming into the church. Now, that doesn't mean the church can't minister to those who have broken homes, but ultimately, it, the church body as a whole, if it has lots of broken marriages it's not going to thrive. A lot of broken people, we need to have people that are healed so that they can help heal and lead other people to healing. And so we see this call, I think, to a healthy church being starting in a healthy home. And in fact, I think it's interesting that we are just now coming out of a month currently that is celebrating the dishonoring of marriage. In fact, we literally hear it being called Pride Month. A month of pride rather than a month of humility. A month that goes against the design and purposes of the family. See, we see it's an assault on God's design. And I wonder how many in the church are willing to be bold and to stand up for marriage. That's what it means to honor marriage. Because I think there are so many today where we are dishonoring marriage by either avoiding it altogether or we are failing to cherish and protect it. 
Think about this. How many today, and I know some of us here are, are a little bit older, but, but how many in the younger generations right now are opting out of marriage? If you just look at the statistics, it's getting a little concerning. How many are just choosing to cohabitate? They're still going to have sex. They're going to still pursue relationships with people. They're going to live together, but they say we don't need the actual marriage part. We don't need the commitment to God as a holy ordinance. We don't need to commit in front of our peers in the public, and we don't need any legal binding agreement. And so what that really shows is they're avoiding the blessings of God. What marriage is meant to do is give you someone who you know is truly committed. But in fa- instead, they choose that they want the pleasure without any of the commitment. So we have so many, even in our churches today, cohabitating, sleeping together without a commitment to marriage. But we also have some on the other side. And some of you may be guilty of this, where we, avo- or, or, where we fail to cherish and protect marriage. How do you fail to cherish and protect marriage? Well, you allow yourself to get a no-fault divorce. That's one of the worst things that has happened to our country is allowing for no-fault divorce. We just grew apart. We fell out of love. Well, the problem is if we hear the words of Christ where we know that he says that there are no reasons for you to just give up on your marriage, that you are to continue in brotherly love, We see these commands for the honor and sanctity of marriage, but we have now a society where we say that it's okay if you're just not happy anymore. They're taking the commitment out of marriage. We also know that you cannot cherish your marriage. You don't continue to date your spouse. You think dating was a period of time, and now we're married, and now we're bored. Or now, all we do is think about the children. Or now we have a mortgage and we have bills to pay and so that's all we're going to focus our attention on. That's not honoring and cherishing marriage. You have to love and date your spouse. You have to care about their needs. Seek to help them and serve them. And also make sure that you keep certain foreign temptations away from your marriage. Because here's the thing, if you aren't dating your spouse and loving and cherishing your spouse, you know what will happen? There will be temptation. For men, it's primarily going to probably be the visual. We're going to be tempted to look towards lusting, pornography. For women, it could be looking for an emotional relationship. Now, you could flip it, and men and women can do either, but typically you see these being the tendencies where where you'll have women, and sometimes it might not even be a a person you know. It could be you get really just um, sucked into all of the romance movies and novels. You know, you can do that and fall into that trap and thinking, my husband should be like this perfect guy that I'm watching on this screen. That all you do is see the the dating phase and then they get married, it's over. Why? Because they don't know what marriage really looks like. Marriage is hard sometimes. Sometimes you fight. Sometimes you don't get along. Sometimes you're tired. Sometimes you're sick. There's a lot of things that happen in marriage. But the problem is, we think that, you know, in this world, we see all this, these movies and these books that, that, that make you think that this is what love is really like. And it's so, you know, it's, we romanticize romance. That's what happens. So we, can be care- we need to be careful not to, not to fail to cherish and protect, which leads then into this warning that we're seeing in the text where it says that the, um, the bed must be undefiled. What this is saying here is that sex belongs in marriage and nowhere else. What we're seeing here is that the bed is actually being described like an altar before the Lord. Have you ever thought of the marriage bed like that? It is literally an altar where you're making an offering to one another and before the Lord. So now if you were to think about your bed and all those sexual relations potentially in your lifetime, how many of them were a pure, holy offering before the Lord? Now, I'm not saying you have to think about all the deep things of theology as you are having a marital moment, but what I am saying is that you need to make sure that you are thinking about the well-being and and the goodness of your spouse, as well as making sure that what you are doing is holy before the Lord. 
that it is glorifying God because we are called to glorify God in all that we do, whether we eat or drink, all that we do must glorify God, including our relationships with our spouses. And it's so important that we hear this because sometimes, you know, the, the topic of sex in the pulpit can be taboo depending on where you're at in denomination and churches, but it's so important that we recognize that sex is so good in the proper context. It's like fire and water. Fire can warm you. It's so good whenever you have it in its right context, but then if you allow it to get out of the perimeter and barriers, it can destroy, consume, it can harm. So it can either warm or harm you. Likewise, the water. We, we can think how water is so refreshing. It's, it can satisfy you, nourish you, but also we know it can drown you. Same thing with sex. In its proper context, de- de- defined by God, we see that it can glorify God and it can be good for us. But we also know that it can truly be destructive. And so we need to have a counter-cultural mindset when it comes to sex because today you will be seeing, reading all of these things that basically even the protagonist is thinking that it's okay to have premarital sex. But what we're seeing here is that there are two categories that it gives will both be judged. It has the fornicators and the adulterers. Now, fornication is, is probably more of a broad category. It really is any sexual act outside of marriage. But we, here, I think, it's probably saying those who are not actually married yet, not having sex before marriage or outside of marriage. But then adultery is having sexual relations when you are married and you're going outside of the marriage covenant, so seeking someone that's not your spouse. Both of these groups we see here are, called, are, are saying that they're, they will be judged. And I think it's really interesting that we see that, that it's saying that they will be judged for this lifestyle. In 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 to 10, it says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. This is important that we hear this. You can't just allow your little pocket sins to thrive. It just says earlier that we have gone to Zion, that we're marching to Zion. The kingdom of God is available for us. But it then says here, but if you keep living a lifestyle with, uh, without repentance in this way, you will not inherit this kingdom. So you can't just say, well, grace is sufficient for me, and I'm just going to keep living in sin. That's not how it works. You have to hear this call to honor marriage to know what marriage is, that it's a permanent monogamous union between a man and a woman to give glory to God and to be the good for the couple who has come together. This is what we're seeing, and I think it's so interesting. I think that there's a reason for the judgment. It's not that God just doesn't want you to have any fun. I think there's a couple things. Well, one, in Ephesians 5, we see how closely connected the marriage covenant is to the relationship between, between Christ and his church. It literally says that the, the husband and the wife are meant to show us a picture of the gospel, how Christ loves his church, how he gave himself for the church. It is wanting to make that relationship thrive. And I think it's so interesting that we think about this, and if you notice, whenever you have monogamy starting to be given up, you also lose monotheism. Likewise, if you give up monotheism, if you give up worshiping the one true God, watch how your sexual ethic changes. I think that they are very closely linked. If you start to live away, you're going to start to not believe correctly. And if you start to not believe correctly, you're going to start to live incorrectly. That's how I think we start to see it being working together. And that's why he says that if you start to seek other spouses, what you're really doing is you're harming your relationship with God. You're going after something that God is saying don't go after. You're actually breaking, you're becoming a spiritual adulterer. You're disobeying God. But more than there just being a final judgment that we know God will judge, but we also know all the consequences that come with sex outside of marriage. I actually had a conversation with a college student um, this past year, and he was messaging me because he was being made fun of at his work because he was saying that he didn't believe that we should have sex before marriage. They, you know, they were mocking him, and he was like, I didn't have any good reasons to explain why 
All of them in the Bible says it. Which, by the way, if the Bible says it and if you don't fully understand, that is still sufficient reason to not do it. But there are so many good practical reasons why not to practice sex outside of marriage. First off, STIs. Used to be called STDs. That is a real risk if you are promiscuous and having sex with people outside of marriage. Because here's the thing. If you both are virgins, it's not going to happen. So we see here that there's a a, a clear risk of potentially getting sick and dying from having premarital sex. Unplanned pregnancies. We have divorced sex and pregnancy for some reason in our culture. We think it's all about pleasure when we don't realize that one of the first things that we find in all of Scripture is the command to be fruitful and multiply because that's what sex was meant to do. But we have unplanned pregnancies and then it leads to an abortion culture because that's their new form of birth control. Is well, the baby's here, so now we have to get rid of it. We have financial obligations. There will be people that you might have to support for the rest of your life because you made one night decision. We also have pair bonding. There are studies going out right now that when you have intimate relationships with another person, there is a pair bonding thing that happens. You release oxytocin that actually makes you more committed and connected to that person. Think about someone now who has had this many relationships with so many different people, and then when they try to really come to the point where I want to settle down and get married, how messed up they are going to be. Now, God can still redeem and restore and heal people, but you know how much harder it's going to be when you have given yourself, paired yourself with so many people, all the emotional distress that goes with that when you give yourself to somebody else? There are marriages that I know to this day that still struggle with that because of someone's past, because they've given themselves. to. to, So we see that there are just so many examples of how it can be harmful to to pursue uh, sex outside of marriage. And so we need to, as a congregation, protect it. We need to cherish it. We need to encourage it. And even if you're someone that is called to singleness, you still want to see it in your body because that's how the church grows. That's how we see the next generation rises up. We need to have marriage being honored in the assembly. Which leads then to the final thing, which is where we are called to be content. If you hear this last command, all the other two, I think, will fall into place. But in verses 5 to 6, it says, Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? So what it does is it gives you a choice here at the end. It says you can choose between either covetousness or contentment. And some of us might be thinking, well, I didn't realize or even think contentment was a choice. But it's true. You can choose to be content. It's a choice. You can choose whether or not you want to give in to covetousness, being jealous, envious of so many other things, or you can truly become and practice and live out a content life. And we live, once again, in a society of covetousness, do we not? Think about every single advertisement you watch. It's either showing you something that you don't have and you want it, or it's, I'm going to give this to you so that other people will want what you have. That's what all of our commercials and advertisements are about. Something you're missing out on and something you need so that other people will praise you. I think about social media envy right now. So many people are anxious and depressed because all they do is spend all of their time scrolling through people's highlights of their lives. You're not going to feel good if all you do is see everybody else's highlights and you wonder, well, my life doesn't look like that. I don't have that. I I still want to get that. We see this all the time. Or the keeping up with the Joneses, that we will go into debt financially just to maintain our status among our peers, that we look like we are doing well, even though we know we're in debt and it's just getting worse and worse. There are so many examples that we give in to covetousness, that we aren't being content in our lives. And I think it's important that we see that covetousness, though we sometimes don't view it to be that big of a sin, we think, you know, if you give a list of some of the sins, you probably don't put covetousness up there near the top. But it was in the Ten Commandments. And in fact, covetousness is veiled idolatry. That's all it is. 
Covetousness is saying, this is more important than God's word. This is more important than my relationship with God. That's what covetousness is. I will not be content because I need something else to fulfill me. But what we find in Ecclesiastes is that it shows us that there is no satisfaction that will be found in materialism. You think that if you get a bigger house, a nicer car, the right relationship, you think all of these things are going to fill you and satisfy you. But the problem is it's not going to happen. In Ecclesiastes 5.10 it says, He who loves silver will not be satisfied with silver, nor he who loves abundance with increase. This also is vanity. It's not going to satisfy you. I've heard a, a comment that when you gain more money, you don't become content. Rather, you just, it, um, you just desire more expensive stuff. That's all it is. It's, you keep wanting more and more because then you just get to a new level where you start to see what other people this level have, and now you want the bigger thing. So you just get more expensive taste. And I've used this example before, but it's just like drinking salt water. When you drink salt water, you think initially maybe you're getting hydrated, but really all it does is make you more and more thirsty. That's what it is when you just keep increasing abundance and possessions. If you're so consumed with winning the lottery, which we have so many that think, oh, my life would be so much better if I just won the lottery, if I just got rich. If you fantasize about that, you need to hear this and be content. You're drinking salt water right now and you think your life's going to be perfect. If you get all that money, all those possessions, not going to happen. You're going to be more thirsty. You're going to be experiencing destruction. And the thing is, what we find here is there is an answer to our covetousness. We can find contentment, and we find it here, where it says, God is our help. And God will never leave you nor forsake you. Why is that good news? Because all of these every, uh, other things, everything that we have in this world will be taken away from you one day. Do you realize that? Everything you have, your house, your bank account, your kids, your spouse, everything will go here on this side of eternity. Everything. But the one thing that will never leave you is God. God will never leave you nor forsake you. He will always be there for you to help you and guide you and give you strength. That is what we are offered in God. That is why he is truly the thing that can give us contentment. So here's the thing. If you have God, you have it all already. And the reason you have God is because of what Christ did. So in Christ, we have everything we need. That's why I love this verse that, you know, I'm sure so many of you have it memorized, but I just constantly come back to it in my mind. In Psalm 23, verse 1, it says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. That means I lack nothing. I have everything I need in Christ. Do you really believe that? That's what this book is trying to show you. Everything. Philippians 4.11, not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. He is writing this while he's in prison because he has Christ. Christ is enough. He makes him complete. He is content in the Lord. Revelation 2.9 says, I know your works, tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. You are already a billionaire in Christ. You don't need what the world offers you. You have Jesus. And here's my last challenge as we're closing here. Do you really believe that Jesus is better than anything else? If you believe that, you will find true contentment. But do you believe that Jesus is better than anything that you are working for currently or praying for? What if what you are working for right now you never get? What if you never get another paycheck? What if you never get another promotion? What if you are praying for something so deeply right now, so passionately, and the answer never is yes? Are you still content? If you can say yes, then you know that Christ is your all in all. He is everything. When we can really understand what this book is trying to get, to see Jesus as bigger than everything else, that is where real, true contentment is. And, and Christ will never leave you. He says at the Great Commission, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. So I pray that we would hear this call this morning, that we would practice practical Christianity, that we would love people, that we would honor marriage, and that we would find true contentment in Christ. Let us pray. Father, we, we love you and we give you praise for all that you do. I pray that you would encourage us to hear these words this morning and to apply it to our lives. 
that we would find contentment in you, realizing who you are and what you've done for us, and that everything else is just additional grace. But ultimately, you are what truly matters. You are our purpose. You are our joy. You are our satisfaction in this life. So Lord, I pray that we would hear this. In Jesus' name, amen.